Uh, hello guys, so my name is Andre and uh, I'm a freelance consultant, mostly, most of my time. Uh, I'm speaking on coaching and writing job code and uh, part, part of my job sometimes is to actually analyze the performance of Java applications running for, for, uh, in production for my clients and that's where, that's where Mr. Playfair actually learned about the gene uh, and that's what I'm going to Tell you today. So let's start. So uh, what, what, what topics we're going to cover is uh, first of all we define what is JIT, and I mean it's JIT, it's not Git. Yeah? So we have to pronounce it correctly because some people may think that Git is is, is the version of system, but JIT is just in time to uh, We'll discuss what what does it do, how to tune it, and do we actually need to tune it. Uh, how many of you guys actually have heard of G before? I mean, I guess you're all Java developers, so well, most of you, right. Great. So, all you know that G is a just-in-time compiler, uh, just-in-time compilation, that is part, essential part of JVM, that is always running inside JVM when you start your Java, Java applications, and uh, the main uh, the main thing that G does is that it tries to compile things from bytecode into native code. And uh, you probably know that bytecode is something that we get from our Java compiler. Uh, and uh, the problem is that bytecode execution is extremely slow. It's tremendously slow. And uh, G is there to help us to make it faster, to, to compile the bytecode in native code and execute it in a matter of maybe nanoseconds or uh, microseconds sometimes. Uh, and G is extremely smart, and at the same time, it tries to uh, compile the code based on the amount of information that it gathers when the application is running. So it's profiling the code, uh, gathering the number of executions, the amount of the shape of the code, and setting the shape of the code internally, and then makes a decision. Should we make this code compiled native? Uh, and the thing is, it also could never happen. Sometimes, the sound of it doesn't mean, if you run your code inside JVM, it doesn't mean that it will, for example, be compiled on native code. It actually, only a small fraction of, of the code is getting compiled. Uh, and G has quite good heuristics about how to decide what, what should, should go there. Uh, so, uh, this is a picture from our LX session below, which basically depicts how the JVM startup uh, happens for, 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 for all applications. Because there's a lot of things that have to warm up before we actually uh, inside the application that is production ready, in how say, which is warmed up and ready to serve requests and uh, do, do some work as fast as possible. Uh, and part of that job is, is G. So, for first of all, we do we have, uh, start up loading all of the runtime classes. We do some internal GC while well, we start expanding the hit. And at some, at some point, we also try to compile all the all, all the important classes, all the all, all, sorry, sorry, all, all important methods, all the code blocks into native code. And only after that, uh, only after the step, we have a standard stabilized heap, stabilized uh, set of classes that are loaded into the application. Only after after a while, after this warm-up period, we actually have an application that is the fastest we can get. And the thing is that JVM is uh, is it's a dynamic environment. Uh, if at some point you would like to, especially the people that was kind of true for application servers, when you, when you upload a new application, you deploy a new application to the application server, then obviously you unload some classes, you load some new classes. And this will provoke uh, this kind of spikes again, because you, you will have to do something with the class loading information, you have to do something with compiling new code loaded into the JVM. And if this is a good thing about JVM, at the same time it's probably not ideal if you think about Because of course, the fastest code you can get is going to be native, but uh, because you have bytecode, we can actually run that bytecode anywhere where Java runs. But, and then the, the purpose of the JVM G is actually make that code run even faster depending on the architecture where this code is running. So if, if it's in the Windows machine, it's going to be do some Windows optimizations based on the uh, operating system architecture, native architecture that is running that can tell us something. If it's going to be Spark or uh, Macos or whatever, it's going to do some, something else. But uh, still, we deploy the same code everywhere. It's going to be the same bytecode, and depending on what which JVM is running that, we're going to 
get different naked code uh, when applications running in a specific environment. Uh, in that sense, uh, JVM is running in kind of mixed mode. So, of course, bytecode, when we execute bytecode, we have to but we have to have a way to execute bytecode, and that's what JVM also does. It has an artificial second sheet, which kind of maps the bytecode instructions to uh, actual computer uh, machine code, uh, and it does that dynamically on, 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 on the fly. Uh, and this is an integrated mode, and this is what, how the code is, is, is executed for the first time. Uh, when you have enough information about how often some, some code pieces are executed, the code may get compiled into native operations, or it also may, may be mapped to native architecture of, uh, of, of a machine where, where it's running. So if, for example, you are in an architecture with which supports registers, then the, the actual uh, bytecode will get converted from a set machine to using registers, which is very <coughs> hardware-specific. Uh, but at the same time, this is the, the, the job of the JVM to do that for you. So you don't need to think about it when, when you actually write your job. Okay. So that, that's why it's called mixing now. So we first interpret the code, run it as bytecode, mapping dynamically the bytecode instructions to uh, the, answer, uh, the machine instructions. And if we have, we see that it's, it's good and very often, then we actually compile that to an AC code, which doesn't do any interpretation and which, which, is, which could be actually a thousand times faster than, than the bytecode interpretation. That's how it happens uh, during application runtime. Basically, any code goes to the interpretation first. Then JVM collects a lot of counters about how often each method was executed, and based on that information, it can do dynamic compilation of the method into, into native code. Uh, also, uh, the, the opposite can happen. So if, if JVM sees that this method was compiled for, for the wrong reason, or this method is not executed anymore, it may evict it from, from native compilation cache and put it back to the interpretation mode, because it wants uh, only the hot code to be executed as often as possible, uh, as, as fast as possible, but not the, the, the cold code. We don't, we, don't, we, don't, we don't want to pollute the cache, the, the, the native compilation cache. We don't, we don't want to pollute that. We actually want to get it as fast as possible. So, uh, and this process, it, it works automatically inside any JVM. And what we, actually, it works automatically since 1.3. I hope none of you are actually using 1.2. Do you? Actually, got quite an interesting question. How many of you use Java 8 in production? Is anyone who's still using Java 7? 6? 5? 4? No, okay, 5, five is this, isn't it? Uh, which is great because uh, I think the, greatest, uh, the biggest optimization that Jeep got uh, was actually in Java 5. Now it's getting that as well, uh, getting more and more uh, advanced and sophisticated, uh, but the biggest work I think was done on the level of Java 5. Uh, and most of the options that I think are still coming from Java 5. Uh, Okay, so uh, the compiling part, uh, it, uh, actually, actually it's, it's gathering a lot of information about how the code is, is executed. So uh, some of the things inside the code, you can get, get the information that, for example, if, if, if something doesn't change, for example, the class information doesn't change, the, the open, unless we want, unless we want to reload the class. Some constants, some, some null values, null values, uh, they, they do not change. So a uh, JIT compiler may uh, see, uh, it, it does see that, that this kind of things, and, and it may make decisions on what kind of code it, it can inline or collapse and uh, make it more more efficient using some native compilation techniques. Uh, but also, it collects information about what kind of uh, how, how, how often uh, this code block is being executed. And of course, the, 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 the well, one thing it does it actually collects the information about the method execution times, the, the, so, uh, the count of method executions, but also it tries to collect information about uh, some if branches or uh, loop branches. So it, it, it will be, sorry. So it can, it can actually see that. So some of the loop values have been executed very often, and it can actually even do the trick that if the loop is very long and it's being executed well, one, one million times, it can see that. Uh, 
array after the like 10,000 10, iterations, it can replace the bytecode block with a native execution block and make the loop execute faster uh, in, in, in the end. So, it, and actually, this can be measured, that's, this can, can, can be shown that, that the G actually does that. And basically, based on all the information, G is trying to be very smart and uh, apply different stuff. So, actually, this is just a very short list of what G can do. Uh, the actual, uh, the, the complete list takes like maybe 10 of these pages. It does a lot of things, and with every JVM release, with every JVM release, it does more and more and more. It's becoming more and more sophisticated of what it's doing, but at the same time, it's seeing kind of very. Uh, because behind the scenes, it's, it's, uh, you, you will not find a lot of information about how to tune it, or do you actually need to tune it, or anyone, any, anybody complaining about it. People will complain about GC, people will complain about uh, uh, locks and synchronization, but nobody complains about it. And the reason for that is because it, it works extremely well. And in most of the cases, uh, I would say that you don't need to tune it at all. Uh, the only guys who claim that, uh, the guys in the map personally, who claim that they need to tune G, were the guys coming from uh, high frequency trading, which they needed low latency applications. They needed uh, to run the code, test the code as fast as possible, and they actually tuned the cache size, they tuned the code shape. Uh, uh, but I would say that for normal business application, that's Really, when, when you actually need to, to configure that, uh, to, 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 to do some optimizations on, on top of the uh, JVM, provide some, some additional parameters. Uh, but still knowing what G does, especially if you're a premium developer or if you're developing a code, a business code that, will be, that, that you know that will run often, uh, then it's, it's worth knowing that, for example, small method sizes will. Increase, increase the probability of method being compiled. Because there's a limit on the size of the method uh, which is taken into account. If you have a method with uh, 10,000 lines, the, um, there's absolutely, uh, it's absolutely guaranteed that method will never be cheated. It will never go, go, go into native code because it's too big. <coughs> so JIT is looking at small methods, it's looking at something that is small enough to, to get fast wins, and also it's looking at uh, Things that are executed very often. So, splitting your methods into small things would, would definitely be more JIT friendly than uh, not doing that. But again, don't, don't expect very huge wins there. Uh, okay, let's quickly go through, uh, through uh, different things that JIT can do. And it's, it's, really, it's really just, you know, just, just touching very mildly of, of what's happening. Now, there's a lot of things to do with the happening behind the scenes. So, uh, one, one of the most aggressive things, so the things that happen more often in, 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 uh, in during JIT compilation from bytecode to native code is in line. Uh, basically, it's, it, it's a way to collide, collide the, the collapse the code from several methods into one method, or maybe remove some code, uh, some unnecessary code call. Uh, because it, it's not needed because it's only one uh, colleague of that code. So, for example, in this, in this particular case, uh, we have a method called add all, which, call, which calls the, does, does some loop, uh, uh, and uh, it calls the method called add. And JIT may see that the only place where the method add is called is here. So no, nobody else is calling this method at this point in time. Uh, and uh, JIT may, based on this information, JIT can do so-called aligning. So instead of uh, having this call, which actually is more expensive, uh, having, having a method call, uh, depending on what kind of it is, it could be very expensive, especially if it's like it's a, it's, if it's a virtual method in, in your uh, polymorphic classes, then this could be very expensive. But if you see, if JIT sees that this is there's only one place where this method is called. We just, we just do it like that. We combine it. Uh, and in this case, it's not normal by bytecode manipulation, or, uh, or uh, it's, it's actually. It's, removed, it's still actually removing the expense of the call for, uh, for the method. And uh, if, for example, if 
there's a new class that is added to, to JVM at some point that actually also calls a guide method. Then the GMA decide to actually decompose it back to some of that and make it again the byte code and uh, insert back everything code. Uh, another thing that may happen as well uh, is that, for example, if you, if, if you know, if, if you have a loop that is known to be over a limited number of options, like a static number of options, like we have up here, that yes, no, maybe, and the compiler, the compiler sees that, it sees that this loop is always going over three options. So what it can, what, what can do, instead of having the loop, which is, is more expensive than, than, uh, uh, than, than this one, it will just replace that. Because th this code is more efficient because it doesn't have a loop very good, you just, just do it at once. So that, that's what G can do. Uh, another thing that uh, G is trying to, to optimize uh, is uh, different things to do with the log. And uh, for example, in this particular case, we have, we, we, we're calling the synchronization block inside the, uh, inside the loop. What we, we call a method which is just synchronized and people do it inside the loop. Of course, it's, it's a bad thing because walking is quite expensive. Uh, especially if you have a lot of CPU, uh, CPU cores. This could be very, very expensive and be, could, could be a common thing for you. So, and, but, but, but because the JIT sees that, we, we, we can do that every option in, 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 the, in, the, in the array of collection. Uh, we just can place the block above. So, and this is a, this is still expensive, but it's less expensive than doing it in a little. So that we can do, do, do for you. Uh, also, uh, another thing you can do is that you can do a local item. So actually, we can remove the locks sometimes. We we'll remove, remove the synchronization blocks because on this particular case, we, we create a new block object. Uh, which will be local. It's a local variable. So obviously, there's no need to lock on local variable because nobody else will have the same local variable. And uh, no, no, actually, we will not have the same variable. It's, it's always a new list. So it's not, not worth locking on uh, something that is always unique. So what can what you can do? Just remove that because no need to lock on something that is unique. It's, that, it doesn't make sense. Of course, it's, it's, a, it's a programmer's mistake in this case. Uh, but somehow, the JIT can, can a bit of can do some uh, uh, magic behind the scenes here. Also, one, one of the, another big thing that, that JIT is doing is this escape analysis. And uh, uh, for example, if we uh, see that we have an object here, new group of okay, and then we're passing that object to another bus and another group. And then, in that, in, the, in this method, we're using added A only. And in this method, we're using added B only. So, it's, it's, it's the same object passed all over everywhere, but it never escapes this method. So, uh, we can actually, instead of passing the object here, uh, we can just pass the actual value. And uh, we can also we can line it all together. So, uh, what happens here basically is that uh, we, we, we collapse these three methods into one. We remove several uh, object uh, method calls, we remove the uh, object allocation, uh, and uh, this actually made the, 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 the final code much faster because, yeah, just because it's faster. Uh, in, in all the versions of hot spots, like 1.3, 1.5, <coughs> uh, this escape analysis was a bit flaky and it was not really, well, yeah, it was kind of experimental, but with 1.6, 1.7, 1.8, it became much, much better. And I think a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of things are happening now, uh, thanks to escape analysis and a lot of optimizations. Uh, one important thing about, about uh, escape analysis and in general, Information that G is taking into account when it does some transitions is uh, called it's called call sign. Basically, that's how many uh, how many calls uh, each of the methods the method calls has, 
and uh, it will not happen. And uh, this basically can be a, like, four, four times monomorphic, bimorphic, or bimorphic, polymorphic, and megamorphic. Uh, and uh, if, I just demonstrated in, 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 in a single jelly cup, so if, if method is steady, then obviously it's monomorphic, meaning that there's only one way to call this method, and there's only one implementation of this method. So it's easy to inline it, or it's easy to replace it with native code because you don't risk anything. You don't risk new classes to be loaded uh, and override the method. Uh, so in the, there's a huge chance that this method will be inlined at some point. Uh, constructors are also monomorphic usually, or well, not usually, but they are monomorphic. And probably this is one of the reasons why you can't really inherit constructors in, in, inside classes in Java, uh, because otherwise they will become polymorphic. Uh, but because it's only one way to call constructor, uh, this is a particular signature, it's also easy to replace constructor with uh, something like code. Uh, in this case, it's bimorphic because we call, well, well the, the list, um, any implementation of the list can, uh, yeah, it should be actually the real list here, uh, because we know that it's a, when we know the concrete implementation, uh, specific implementation of the array list, of the, of the list and it should be a array list in this case. And uh, the, the, the only thing it can call additionally is the method inside the list object itself or the collection itself. So and then uh, the, we only have two places basically where uh, two, two, two methods that are, could be called and two, two, two different implementations that could be called and that then we uh, can optimize based on that. If we have something that is having some base class and we call it to a string, for example, that's obviously it's polymorphic. And polymorphic is obviously hard to, to optimize because we don't know when the new class will be created. When, uh, especially if you're in a highly dynamic environment, when you, when you create classes yourself uh, on, on, on the fly, or you, or you do redeployment of applications which do which does the uh, unloading the classes and loading them again, uh, polymorphic is probably the, the worst thing you can actually find because uh, it's not it's not different in that sense. On, on the other hand, of course, it's it's, it's the consequences of having um, object-oriented language with uh, all, 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 all the features it has, and that's why it's called polymorphic. So there's a benefit there in the focal modeling, but it's definitely not different at the same time. Okay, so. And again, I've touched only surface here because there are many, many more things that uh, JIT is doing, and uh, they're coming with every release, so it does a lot of things. Uh, but one thing that doesn't change that much is, well, it does change, but now it's kind of stabilized. Uh, basically, G has several compiler modes. Uh, the first one is client mode, which at this point is not available in uh, Java 8 if you're running on a 64-bit machine. 60, if you run 64 bit JVM. So basically, when you specify minus client uh, when you run a start Java machine, uh, then this doesn't have that. If you're running some, some older versions, this will still have that. Uh, and uh, basically, this is the client mode, or C1 compiler, is targeted at uh, client application, desktop applications, to do uh, translations as fast as possible and as aggressive as possible to allow. The, the user, uh, the desktop user, to have, have better experience. Uh, server mode, which we should get when you run, which is actually you, you get by default in the uh, And in the, the server mode is basically giving you the server like environment where it tries to optimize aggressively, but it tries to also do, do that based on the profiling information it gathers while the application is running. So basically, uh, the startup time for server is slightly uh, slower. At the same time, it also takes more time to came to a state where we have the worm application, where we have all we know all the hot methods and we inline them, and uh, uh, and it uses profiling information to do that. So this is less aggressive, but at the same time, faster target times. This is more more aggressive in terms of uh, how much code actually gets into it and gets compiled, but also it uses profiling information. And uh, the actual mode that is used since uh, 1.7 uh, is tiered mode, actually basically combining those two together. Uh, and uh, so it's, it's running C1 and C2 at the same time. 
So getting benefits from both of them. Uh, so the initial versions of CMC1 compiler were just it's, it's for startup, uh, but no profiling information. Uh, the C2 compiler provides so works on plus plots, uh, analyzes the call signs, and all the uh, uh, registries, and also it profiles only after you have to your methods that uh, have been called uh, 10,000 times, which obviously will only happen if your application is actually doing something. Uh, also, it's trying to inline modern morphing and biomorphic calls. Uh, some transitions also do the polymorphic calls, but again, it's, it's more, more complicated than that. Uh, and the actual model that is used on Java 1.8 by default is the uh, tiered compilation, where you actually have several levels of, of what's happening, and this is, this is all happening at the same, at the same time. Actually, there are several threads. Uh, running together with every with each J JVM that we start, uh, and uh, I'll, I'll, I'll try to show you during during the demo. Uh, you, you will see that for C1 we have one thread, for C2 we have one thread per core. If I'm not mistaken, so uh, they're always running behind the scenes and doing the job compiling the right code to make it good. These are the, 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 the levels that we have, and. Of course, most of the code still, still runs under level zero, which is just plain white code execution. Uh, and the good thing is that we can, if we can actually monitor JIT uh, quite a lot, but it doesn't have flags that allow that. There's a, a lot of output that it produces. And it's always interesting to see the decisions uh, that, that JIT is making. Uh, at the same time, I would say that probably it's not all tuning that for, for business applications, but it's definitely more tuning for frameworks, definitely more tuning for uh, uh, low latency applications. Uh, at the same time, I would say that uh, because now we have a tendency of you know, delivering smaller applications like microservices with, with uh, frameworks like Spring Boot, for example, or uh, it, it could be even smaller, just plain job applications with, without application server, uh, there's a few big the probability that the code, your business code, will actually need some JIT optimization is growing with time. Maybe it's not yet that important, but it will probably come uh, to better extent. Okay, so I'll show you that uh, during my demo. So yeah, uh, the print compilation flag is the one that uh, adds the additional log and, and additional information that is put on the standard output, which uh, says what kind of methods have been uh, class name, method, uh, method name, and the size of the native code block that has been compiled from bytecode to native code. So to, just to get a bit of insight, what is getting compiled? Uh, we can use print compilation flag, and this flag is on the two of them. Uh, and that's, that's what you can do with this account. Yeah, basically, it just says the method name, the number of bytes, and then there's some flags. Which I'll, I'll show you that. Yeah, not that good, right? Mm -hmm. I'll show you the example. That. That's, that's probably going to be better. Uh, and well, that, this is probably also a bit better. Uh, uh, this is the typical. Uh, Group log, uh, <coughs> print compilation log that you can get from any JVM. And uh, the, the first column is basically the time uh, from the JVM start in the milliseconds. Uh, the second one is. Uh, I, don't, yeah, I don't remember what that was. But uh, the, these are the flags. For example, this one means that this method has an exception, uh, it's for all exceptions. This method is native. This method is in, in, in progress. And uh, some of them, but also some additional steps can be printed here. So, for example, here you see that uh, some de optimization happens at some point uh, because JIT uh, notice that this code is not called anymore, or this code has a new uh, class loaded, uh, that a uh, polymorphic class loaded that may have additional condition. That's all. The code inside native code cache became invalid. And we need to reconsider the decision. And at that point, we made it, uh, JG makes it, makes it, makes, makes it not re entrant, uh, not entrant. So nobody else can execute that native block anymore. But at the same time, uh, it could be that someone is still executing that block. Uh, and one JIT is absolutely clear that nobody else is executing the block, then it's moving it to the zombie mode. And eventually, it makes the garbage collection to remove the, the zombie out, out, out of the cache. 
Uh, and this happens all the time. So this happens for every application. So it, G will only stop doing something when, when, they, when, when the cache is full. But uh, I actually never seen this, this kind of situation. It always stays somewhere on, on top of the, of, 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 of the cache size, and uh, always something is happening, especially if the application is really uh, wide and doing something. Uh, yes. So, oh, but by default, uh, all, all, all the compilers, C1 compiler, C2 compiler, they are optimistic compilers. So they try to recently optimize basically for performance information. So they try to make optimistic decisions about, okay, we, we've seen that this code block was called 10,000 times. Let's streamline it. But then after a microsecond or millisecond, it sees that, okay, this method has been, uh, a, new, a new implementation of the method has been loaded, or this method will discuss was unloaded for some reason. And this could happen on an application startup, for example, or an application lifetime. Uh, and then it has to deoptimize that. It has to uncompile the code into basically the compiled code and then maybe work in an integrated mode. So, in, in that sense, they can the C1 and C2, they are optimistic compilers. So, they're only based on uh, information that is given to them, or based on the execution. Uh, And um, yeah, we have some flags that describe the problem. Basically, with some of them you've seen in in, in, in the logs. So, so, so if the method methods may, may, may not end up, that means that it needs to be deoptimized because something else has changed. Uh, yeah, that's maybe too much about that. Uh, and again, the often for most of the code, actually, G will not do anything, and the. the the, the, the main reason for that is that the code is too big, uh, or the code is not executed uh, to, to it's, not, it's not executed too, too many times. Uh, so in, in that sense, JIT is very good at detecting hotspots, and, uh, and especially if you're using some kind of framework, then there's a bigger chance that the framework code will be uh, in, in line or compiled native code rather than your application code. But yeah, looking at that, we could give some examples. Some, 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 some. So, yeah, these are the flags from, uh, from, from G to Divago, which uh, we saw in a couple of previous slides. So, uh, uh, this actually means on sec replacement. So, sometimes when the code is, for example, to, uh, for example, when you start your application, your, your main method, uh, it may have, it, it, it may never exit. And I, I, actually, G cannot really compile uh, uh, the code that is being executed. I will take advantage of, uh, of the na native compilation when the code is being executed. That's why it has its own stack replacement, which allows to replace the code blocks that are inside the current application stack trace or current thread stack trace. So, uh, for example, if you're getting a long loop, or you're going, always going through through a certain path of, for example, serial filters, I don't know, something like that. It could be that uh, G will take a decision that, okay, I see that this active code block that has been executed all, all, all the time, but I, I can't really uh, compile the methods independently, so I have to make some stack replacement uh, while the code is being executed and make the next uh, stack execution uh, uh, using the code. Just to give more explanation about how the whole this log is uh, done. Uh, another set of options that can be used to free information about uh, what G is doing is a lot of diagnostic VM options. is something that you need to specify if you want to really deep dive, uh, dive deep sorry, in, 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 into what JVM is doing. And in, in order for, that, for this option to work, you need this option as well. So, print and lining will show you information about what exactly you in mind. So, what, what is uh, being in line to, uh, based on the decision that you've made. Uh, yeah, this is very bad. Okay, I'll show you during the demo. I'll show you during the demo. Yeah, some things that usually are in line, uh, no matter what. And uh, actually, for some of them, actually, JVM has uh, uh, if, if even native code, code implementation, so it does that almost automatically. Uh, but for this thing, uh, methods from map, methods from system, methods from string, 
uh, was a huge chance. They, 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 well, not, not, not in a huge thing. It's like well, almost 100% guarantee that they're going to be compiled. They're going to be compiled in code because they execute from almost from every class. Uh, but also some, some, some other things. Uh, what, what you can do with JIT uh, is the size of, 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 of the line and uh, of the method that could be in line. And by default, it's 35 uh, byte code instructions. Uh, if you have more, if you have a long method, then those, yeah, JIT will not take it into account. And if you really have a lot of methods that are bigger than that and you want them to be in line, you can try to play with that instruction with the same, but I would not recommend that. I would better try to make the code uh, look different. Uh, you can also play with the frequency, so how, how frequently the code should be executed before we actually we'll try, we'll try to get it in line. Uh, we, also, we can limit the level of how deep the methods can be in line because, if, of course, we have, we, we call methods, we call other methods that have a lot of methods. And uh, the, the default limit for that is 9, so if you have uh, two long calls, the method calls, they will, they will not be in line, but you can again try to play with that. Again, I would not recommend that because it also influences the time, the compilation time, and it influences the analysis time. Uh, so, uh, additional G plugin that some of these parameters have been introduced uh, in Java 8 only. Uh, for example, with slow compilation, uh, which is uh, logging uh, instead of the standard output, actually logs into a log file in the, mo the best format ever in XML. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's, the thing that actually logs into a file is, 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 is better than logging into the standard output because standard output can be polluted with, uh, with a lot of things. Uh, including the GC logs and uh, some other stuff. So uh, the, the good thing that is going on in, in JDK in general is that they, they try to make some sense out of, out of all the logging information that JVM can produce. And that GC logging, JIT logging, and uh, many, many, many other things. Uh, so you, you can also do pre the, 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 the code cache. So the, the, the native code is compiled. Into, is put into a cache, and we, we, we can print statistics about that code cache. Uh, and we can also do that every time some compilation is happening. Uh, also, if you're really into assembly language, you can even print uh, things that are transformed into assembly language, the actual, the actual code that is the actual native code, you can actually print it out. I, I never tried it, and I'm not, I'm not sure I'm actually interested in that, but if you're really into that, you can try that as well. Also, you can influence the size of the of, of the cache code, code size, uh, and by the full is I think in Java 8 it was 256 megabytes for 64 bit machines. Uh, it was smaller for, for older JVMs, but again, I, I never seen that is going about that. Okay, let me show you a small demo. Uh, do we have time? Okay. Uh, okay. Let me make it bigger. Is it better? So let me first show you how how actually JIT is influencing the, the the execution. So this is a Groovy script. How many of you guys know Groovy? Some of you. Well, anyway, I guess I guess you know that so this is a language running into JVM, and that it actually is a dynamic language, so it does a lot of things, uh, despite of the very sh short uh, size of the code. And in this case, it's just summing some stuff. Uh, and if I run this without J, just uh, you not know, run without JIT, I just specify the minus x int, which means fully integrated mode, so don't use JIT at all. And if I run it and uh, start it, so uh, it's like 30 seconds. Let me run it again so we. Well, yeah, it's three, three seconds or three seconds, three seconds. 
Yeah. So without you, in, in fully incubated mode, we are only incubated by uh, it's running in three seconds. Uh, and uh, the three seconds is only about uh, uh, about the, the, this loop, basically. So we have it here, and then we print the, the execution time after the, after the loop. If I run the same one with default mode, with Gdenable, just oh, sorry, just with Groovy script, uh, without uh, uh, we'll see that it's going to be much faster. So as you see, uh, just from plain bytecode, it adds 10 percent, uh, 10, 10 times improvement in, in, in the execution time. So uh, and of course. Uh, I, I, I have chosen this example because Ruby does a lot of things uh, when it loads. It does a lot of you know, re reflection and uh, dynamic code execution. Uh, and the benefits are, are tremendous. And uh, for, for real Java applications, it could be even, could be even more because it optimizes uh, uh, quite fast, quite aggressively, and quite early also in the process. Uh, okay. Let me show you. This is not quite visible. <laughs> and this is what, what you get when, when we print, uh, when we specify print cancellation. And, and as you can see, that things like string patch go out, uh, string index off, and uh, string in an object in a map mean, uh, something that is. Even for a simple program, which just does some uh, summing and, and uh, not much, and just bring, bring, bring out some stuff on, on, on the start output, uh, it actually does already in line and uh, compile things into native code. And now that the program has started uh, for real, uh, and we can see that uh, a lot of things have been made, first of all, uh, compiled in line in this case. Like for example, Java line reference removed and then made not re -entered. Probably because uh, on, on JVM start we're loading classes and we have actually those classes using some Java code already, uh, which uses uh, which could be compiled because we, we see that they it is it is good and and, and I, I can expect that a lot of things which will do happen when the classes load load for the first time and, and then G is getting rid of them because the more stuff coming into the cache. Uh, we actually get real code, and the GC is starting to work, and the GC threads are starting to work, and all, 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 all that stuff. Uh, if I take a look at this is JJ Visual VM, probably you know that. Uh, if, if, if I connect, can I connect to that? Okay, uh, if I go and take a thread down of this, uh, this process. You you would see that of course we have JMX or nine all that all, all, all that stuff that is usually uh, happens with for every JVM but also we see that we have the C1 compiler thread C2 compiler thread and C2, in another C2 compiler thread so and they work in parallel always with every JVM you will you will find them for every JVM unless you were running in, in fully embedded mode and th this is what. This is the main uh, uh, workers that, that they work all, all, all the time. That they produce this log, uh, which and then, as you see, because I have connected over JMix, it has to compile uh, some stuff that is JMix related in this case, because yeah, JMix is using JVM as well. Okay. Uh, another good thing that I found recently is called uh, G Watch. Uh, it's a huge visualization of uh, it's, well, it's a really visualization tool, analysis tool for GitLogs, and it only works for uh, later uh, JVM versions like Java 7, Java 6, uh, Java, Java 8, where we have this uh, XML logs uh, available. And this is the oh my gosh, make it uh, this is the this is how the, the XML looks a little bit like. Uh, oops. And it's very easy to get uh, huge logs very fast because uh, uh, all it takes now, you know. Uh, and 
it has this uh, information about uh, uh, the code cache size, the, 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 uh, the number of uh, compiled methods inside the uh, number of bytecode instructions, so all, all the statistics it has in, in, in that block. And when, when you do optimizations of your libraries or uh, your low level scale, this log can, can, can become very interesting because you, you can actually see what, what, which code is being getting compiled and why. Uh, and just to show you what it has, so, uh, let's open the log. Let's open this one. So basically, when we load the log, we have to replay the log. And uh, this is the execution of Spring Fat Link application. You guys know Spring, and you know Backlink is a showcase application for Spring frameworks. Uh, so yeah, and uh, it also after parsing the logs, uh, after uh, analyzing what what JIT actually did during the execution, uh, JIT Watch allows us to uh, get information about how many native bytes per compiled method we have, or how how many uh, JIT can, uh, how many how much time JIT has spent in, uh, in, in uh, during compiling the code. Uh, which may be uh, interesting to see, uh, uh, especially if you have different load patterns on the application. You can try to uh, simulate uh, and, and analyze the logs and see if really JIT is uh, being overused and if, if really if you have the, the right code inside the JIT, in JIT cache. Uh, and yeah, it's a really good tool. It looks like I, mean, I haven't used it very, very often, uh, very much yet. But I, will, I definitely will because it, it provides a lot of good hints uh, about the code cache, for example. So this is the size of the code cache. Uh, initially, it was like 256, or more roughly the same. Now we are, uh, well, after uh, a while, after a couple of minutes of run of application with some load on, on top of that, we get to uh, 200 megabytes. It, 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 225 megabytes. So it's quite hard to fill the cache actually because the native, native code is small. Uh, well, it's obviously small because it's only a few, 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 few bytes usually. Uh, and uh, fill, filling the cache uh, based on profiling information is quite hard. Okay, I think, I think, I think I'm done. Uh, one question that uh, I had at some point and probably you guys also have. Is that is it is, is it both? <coughs> can we just compile everything on JVM start? And uh, the answer is probably, uh, but it would take more time. On the other hand, since we all already populated the cache with some data, can we preserve that cache between JVM restart? Uh, and the answer is not not for Open JDK, not for Oracle JDK, uh, but for some other JDKs. They have uh, so-called ahead of time uh, compilation which implements this kind of techniques of preserving the cache between JVM restarts uh, or uh, aggressively compiling the code uh, on, on JVM start, having, having a longer... Uh, JDK 9 because it's... That's my next slide, actually. <laughs> uh, and uh, finally, luckily, uh, JDK 9 uh, has approved uh, that ahead-of-time compilation is going to be part of uh, JDK 9. And, uh, well, honestly, I'm not sure what it means because it says like status is completed, but resolution is unresolved. Uh, but I guess it's going to be there because what, what they say here in the command is that we decided to make EOG feature as experimental in JDK 9 without exception, uh, meaning that it will apply to all libraries, all, all JDK classes. So they, they will try to make EOG. It's going to be experimental, but it's definitely a, a good thing because if you think about using Java and uh, JVM, in uh, small environments like mobile phones, like uh, embedded devices, uh, uh, all, all, all the work that, ha that happens now on JDK 9 level, where we have this mo 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 modular system which allows us to create smaller, uh, small, smaller runtimes, and with, with, with the help of AOT, ahead of time compilation, we, we can get faster execution times, faster uh, startup times, and this is all great. So, Java 9 is going to be awesome, I hope. Uh, so yeah, final words for me. Uh, so first takeaways. So 
as you probably already get, because the compiler is on by default and it works well by default, I would say. You don't need to tune it that, that, that much. Uh, and it's also very hard to fill the cache. Uh, Gcompile is going to go from basic profile information, so it's important how old the code is called, and it only can be collected when application is actually running. Uh, and it's worth tuning for frameworks, high performance, low latency scenarios, but maybe not for business apps. And method size and full frequency does matter. Some reading stuff. Actually, I have some books with me. If you want to take a look, uh, yeah, I have some, some, some of these books with me. Uh, 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 also, some links that I used to, uh, to uh, some some good links about how G works and how JVM in general works are on the slides. The slides will be shared on Twitter and uh, probably on on Google website. Uh, so the books, this one is, uh, is is a really great book. Uh, the, the, the the only problem is that it's uh, written about Java 1.6, slightly about 1.7. Uh, doesn't include that much information about G1 uh, garbage collection. Uh, so recently, actually last year, they released uh, Java Performance Companion, which actually only mostly focused on G1 uh, garbage collection. So these two books, to, if, if you buy one, you have to buy the other one. Uh, otherwise, it doesn't make sense. Uh, and this one is pretty good as well, even though again it's slightly slightly outdated in terms of. Uh, uh, like G1 and uh, the latest editions, but still very good because a lot of things that have been introduced in JVM, uh, starting in version 1, 2, 1, 3, 1, 4, they still are there and they still are quite effective and uh, quite useful. Uh, especially, it has a lot of information about G, how G works in general. Most of this one is, is, is a good book. Uh, people to follow. Uh, yeah, the, the, this, so some of the guys that, that I've uh, seen uh, present live and I've talked to, uh, very good uh, people to follow if, if you need more information about how JVM works in general. Uh, also, if you really want to dive deep, 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 deep down, sorry, uh, you can go to OpenJDK source code because it contains uh, all, all things we talked about today, like inlining, uh, localizing, all, all that stuff. That code is there. It's actually not that's super hard to read sometimes, but well, it's supposed to be good. Uh, could be, could be, could be quite interesting. Uh, okay, any questions to me about JIT, JVM? Um, so, what was the limit for how polymorphic uh, some execution can be? Like, three polymorphic or well, polymorphic? Uh, well, if it's more than two, then it's polymorphic. So, uh, really? Well, it has some optimizations. I mean, if it's finite, uh, like only three, not two, but three, then well, it's uh, not uh, 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 I would not answer how, how much uh, you that actually you're looking at because they, they try to optimize, improve this uh, logic and heuristics about uh, what, what, what they do with polymorphic code, uh, whatever, whatever JDK release. So, with bimorphic and monomorphic, it's easy. Uh, and it's already has been implemented in 1.3, 1.4. But with polymorphic, it's harder, so that they have a lot, a lot of heuristics there. It's not just uh, you know one one way to do that. Do you see some heuristics or uh, 